be seated. We have uh, been going through this series looking at Paul's missionary journeys and talking about being, <coughs> excuse me, being sent out. And if you remember, this is, this is really something for everybody who follows Jesus. When Jesus calls his disciples, he says, follow me, connect with me, plug in with me, and I will send you out to fish for people. And the Apostle Paul, he was a leader of a church of Antioch in Syria, and God gave him this vision of what he wanted Paul to do. And so Paul started chasing after Jesus and, and going out, and God told him that he was to connect people who were far away from God back with him. And though the journey was difficult and it required tenacity and persistence, he was fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit. God clarified for Paul and for others around him that, that to connect with God didn't mean that you had to be a part of the Jewish religion didn't mean you had to, to follow all of the Old Testament commandments. It meant that you had to surrender your life to Jesus and realize that he is the one who died on a cross for your sins. They said, let's make it easy for people to come into a relationship and into a connection with God instead of making it difficult. He had a team of people who worked with them and yet as they journeyed, sometimes they would come across roadblocks and barriers and they said, we wanted to go this way and, and God stopped us and yet he used that to direct them to where he was taking them. Sometimes they found themselves in the midst of chains of life, and yet it was their worship. It was taking a moment to pause and to realize that my God is greater, that, that broke the chains of their life and freed them. They had accomplices who joined them and risked taking an association with Jesus and the gospel to be fishers of people. Last week we talked about Paul and his time in the church of Corinth. We said that Paul was a master at connecting his life with other people. And so we looked at these groups of people that Paul connected with, newbies and, and partners and outsiders. And, and this week we want to look at how and where Paul made the connections that he did. So I hope this morning that you brought something with you. I hope you brought a Bible of some sorts. If you don't have one, I would love to be able to provide you with a Bible. There's also one in front of you in the pews there. Um, you can use a digital Bible and download one for free. That's, that's still the Word of God. It's not the paper that matters. It's the words that matter. But I'd love to see that Bible. If you got your Bible with you, go ahead, grab that out, lift that in the air and say, I got my Bible, PJ. Got my all right, you can go ahead and start turning to Acts chapter 18. Uh, that's where we're going to be reading again this morning. Last week we kind of acknowledged the fact that making connections with other people is an important part of what God is asking us to do. And yet for a lot of us, it's, it's easier said than done. For some of us, it's, it's downright difficult. And sometimes I think one of the hardest parts is simply knowing where do we go? Like, what do we do in, in connecting our life with others? And I think it can be very helpful sometimes in life to have somebody who can point us in the right direction. Think of a story of a, a little boy who lived in a, a small rural town in, in southern Indiana, and his mom was in the grocery store, and he was sitting outside the grocery store one morning, and um, this gentleman walked out of the store, and he, he saw the boy sitting there, and he said, excuse me, son, uh, I'm kind of new in town, can you tell me how to get to the post office? And the boy said, sure, you just go down this way about five blocks, and if you turn to your left, and you'll see the post office is down there about a block on your right. And the man says, well, thanks, thanks. Hey, by the way, I, I'm the new pastor at the Wesleyan Church in town. I'd, I'd love to invite you out to church this Sunday, and, and I'll show you how you can get to heaven. And the little boy kind of lets that soak in for a minute, and he looks back at him, and he says, ah, oh, come on, you don't even know the way to the post office. <laughs> Sometimes all we need to accomplish a goal in life is to have somebody who can point us in the right direction. And often that's somebody who is, has been where we want to go and we're following them and they can kind of say, I've been there and let me show you where I've been, show you kind of what I've learned and, and how you go that direction. So again, Acts chapter 18, we're going to look at Paul and, and we read some of these verses last week, but we're going to go back over them again this morning. Acts 18 starting at verse 1 says this, it says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. 
But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed, and they were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. He said, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. No one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. And so this morning I want to look with you at how and where the Apostle Paul goes to make these connections. Again, we talked about the connections that he's making. He, he connects with newbies and Priscilla and Aquila. He, he connects with the partners of Timothy and Silas. And, and he connects with outsiders and the Gentiles in his world. But I want to kind of talk about how does he make those connections and where do we make connections in life. And so we'll kind of take the how question. We'll start and stop on that. And we'll, we'll look at the where question in the middle. And the how, sometimes I think we want like there to be this deep, dark secret. And if you're introverted like me, you, you sometimes think like extroverts have like this real secret thing that they do. And, and if I just did that, then I could be better at connecting with people. But the reality that I see in, in the Apostle Paul's life is that he shared life together with people. That was the secret. That was the truth, is that Paul was willing to take the life that he had and to share it with other people. To pay attention to the people that, that God had placed in his path and to intentionally look for ways to say, I want to connect more with these people. I want to do something more and be intentional about connecting with them and bringing Jesus into the connection that I have with them. We share life with people by simply sharing the things that, that make up our life, right? Um, one of them, probably the, the first one being our time. And for so many of us, we, we all think, I probably if I took a poll of our congregation and said, are you really busy? Probably nobody would say, nah, I've got loads of time. I'm just, I'm twiddling my thumbs all day. I can't figure out what to do. We all feel like I don't have any time. But part of what it means to share our life with others is to, to stop giving the I'm too busy for you excuse and to be willing to look at the people that God puts in our path and to say, I'm going to give you some time. I'm going to connect with you and to share my time with you. Sometimes we share life by sharing experiences with somebody where, where we do something together. Uh, we might share resources with somebody, and, and we, we sometimes think of, uh, of money when we say that, but there's lots of resources that we have, like, like maybe your neighbor's working on his car, and he needs a tool, and he doesn't have it, but you have it, and, and it's a way for you to connect with your neighbor by saying, sure, you can borrow that. Maybe we share our gifts and our talents. Maybe our neighbor's saying, hey, I'm working on my car, I'm, I'm completely lost, and he comes over to borrow the tool, and he's like, I don't even know what I'm doing, and we can be like, I know how to do that. Let me come on over there and let me help you and, and share the, the gifts and the talents that I have. Sometimes we share life by sharing our heart, sharing our, our emotions. And, and sometimes that means we laugh together and sometimes we cry together. And you know, we think about laughter and, and laughter has such a way of, of bonding our life together with somebody. Like I'm not saying that all locker room humor is, is a good thing. But that's a part of a bonding experience for people sometimes, right? Because when you get together and you laugh and you enjoy time being with somebody, there's a, a bonding that happens. We, we share our heart when we cry together. And again, it's this bonding thing when we're willing to be real and authentic and genuine and to, to connect with somebody else and, and not have to have everything all together. My, my life isn't all perfect. I have questions and I have doubts and I have struggles as well. We were all taught to share when we were kids. Whether it was sharing with a sibling or sharing with the kids at school or sharing playground equipment, we were probably all taught as kids to share. My family, last year we went to Jillian School and a couple times a year they have these book fairs where they have books. And We walked in last year and there was this one brightly colored and kind of humorously illustrated book called Pig the Pug. And we have a pug as a, our family pet, and so this, this book was kind of a, a must-have for the Wickstrom family. And so we brought home the book Pig the Pug. And, and the story of Pig the Pug is, is Pig has a lot of toys, and he really enjoys all of the toys that he has. And he lives with a little wiener dog named Trevor. And it says that Trevor is constantly saying, hey, will you share? Will you, will you play with me? And, and Pig says to Trevor, I will share with you never. <laughs> 
And, and Pig gathers all of his toys and he, he puts them into a big heap and he, he stands on top of the heap of toys and he looks down at Trevor and he says, they're mine, 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 mine. But he doesn't realize that his big mound of toys was right next to an open window and, and Pig the Pug falls outside of the open window and then the next pages of the book it says it's, it's different these days, I'm happy to say. And, and it shows Trevor playing with all of the toys and, and says that Pig is happily sharing and then it shows Pig's in a full body cast and really can't do anything about sharing his toys with Trevor anymore. I think one of the more subtle and yet poignant morals of the story is that that often we are the ones who are hurting the most when we refuse to share. In, in the long run, we miss the enjoyment of really connecting with somebody else. When, when we refuse to share our life with somebody else because I'm too busy or I don't want to be real and authentic and, and I don't want to take the time or I don't want to share my resources with somebody else, we're the ones who, who suffer in that time. As a, a theology reminder, the reason that connecting with other people is so valuable is they're created in God's image. Every single human being that you encounter is a person created in the very image of God. And so on a theological level, in a very real way, our, our connections horizontally with one another is a way that we plug into our connections with God. And this is even more so true when we're talking about the hurting and the exploited and, and the underprivileged among us. Jesus reminds us of this in Matthew 25, 40. When you've connected and done for the least of these is what you've done for me. When we fail to open our lives and share with others, we miss out on what God wants to do in our life. We are hurting ourselves on a, a spiritual level by not connecting our life with, with others. As followers of Jesus, we ought to realize Jesus is the one who set the example in this, right? He gave up heaven to step into our world and to associate with some of the lowest classes of society. Far be it from us to close off our lives and hold our time and energy and resources to ourselves. We ought to purposefully, as Jesus was incarnational, as he stepped into our world, step into the world of others and connect with them and share our time and our lives with others. So where do we go? Where do we go to, to make these connections? And I think if we look at Paul's time during Corinth and, and look at this story in these, in these few verses, there's four places where I see that we have the opportunity to form connections that I think God wants us to pay attention to. I think Jesus would say, as part of this called to follow and sent out mission that I have you on, these are four places where you ought to be looking to connect your life with the newbies and the partners and the outsiders. And the first one is at work. In verses 2 and 3, we're told that Paul connected with these newbies, Aquila and Priscilla, because of a work relationship. Paul was a tent maker by trade. It's, it's what he did to earn money. We, we learn in other places of scripture, this is how he supported his ministry and his missionary work that, that God had called him to be a part of. And, and while he's here in Corinth, he, he joins his life, he connects, he shares life working with Priscilla and Aquila. Actually, I think it's kind of interesting that when he's working with them to think about the fact that actually they are probably the ones who have been in Corinth longer. Excuse me. And they are the ones who are willing to, to welcome this outsider and this newbie into their work circle and to connect with him. He, he's probably business competition. And yet they're willing to work together with Paul. Whatever you do for work, it is likely to be one of the best places for you to be open to God connecting your life with someone else. If you're employed full-time, you spend somewhere between 30 and 45% of your waking hours at work. And that can vary based on how many hours you work and how many hours you sleep and when you take vacations and all of that. But as a rough figure, about a third of your life is spent at work. And chances are you probably spend more time with the people you work with than anybody else in your life other than yourself. And I get that most of the time we, we don't get to choose who, who we work with and who our coworkers are. And, and sometimes they might be people that we don't naturally click with. But, but this is one place that I think we ought to be seeking connections intentionally for the sake of the gospel. We can't afford to neglect the kingdom responsibility that God has given to us to engage with people in that environment. 
And I know there's, there's different rules and, and, and the rules and how you can talk and what you can do. They're probably as divergent as the different companies that you could work for. But God is calling us to actually connect with people. To, to have relationships with people. And, and this doesn't mean like that, that when we're trying to connect with people at work and, and connect them with Jesus, it doesn't mean that like when they're not looking, we sneak a gospel tract onto their desk. We try to get away without talking to them. Uh, it doesn't mean that we wait around the water cooler and we, and we try to give scare tactics and say, if you died tonight in a car wreck on your way home, when the train hits you, where are you going tonight? It, it doesn't mean that we, we condemn them and say, hey, I saw you. You took a cigarette break earlier today. But it means that we open up our life. And we're willing to look at the people that we work with and to say, I, I want to share life with these people. Not just view this as a place where I come to get a paycheck and I can't wait for 5 o'clock or whatever time I can check out. But, but God has me here not just as a way to provide for my family financially, but God has me here. A third of my life is spent here. God wants me to be here and to engage with the people who are here. And again, we, we look for, for newbies. And we can say, who are the people at work that are, that are maybe new to the company? And, and how can I invite them and, and teach them what I know, show them around the company, introduce them to people, help them to experience some of what I've experienced? Who are the people that are partners at work? Who are the people who maybe they share my faith? And maybe they don't go to the, this church, but maybe they, they, they follow Jesus. And we can partner together and we can say, hey, maybe we can meet for 15 minutes before work and we can just pray for God's safety over our team today. Or, or, or maybe these are the guys that we can just kind of hold each other accountable and we can kind of say, are we being a good witness? Are we showing people the love of, of Jesus and, and how he has transformed us? And, and, and hey, when I drop a hammer on my toe, check me that I'm not saying four-letter words and letting them fly, you know? And we have partners that we can connect with at work. And we have outsiders and, and people that are probably completely different from you. And, and it's natural for everybody else at work to kind of gather around and, and point the finger at how they're, they're different. But, but maybe God would call us to connect with them and to share life together. Second place um, that I see in this story of a place where we're supposed to form connections isn't actually uh, in the life of the Apostle Paul. Um, but I would say that we are supposed to form connections with our family. Because outside of work, probably the people that we are connected to um, the most frequently and the most deeply are members of our family. It probably is the strongest bonds that we have in our entire life. And in this passage, we find this, this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. And besides just being tent makers who are new to Corinth and, and working with Paul, there's another thing that's just interesting about this couple. They are an extremely tight-knit couple. In fact, they're one of, they might be the only, but they're, they're one of a few couples that um, every time we see them in Scripture, they're mentioned together. You never hear a story about just Aquila. You never hear a story about just Priscilla. And, and, and they, they move with Paul. They're, they're more than just this story. But every time you see them, they are together. And we'll talk about some of the potential reasons for that maybe a little bit more next week. But they just move together as one unit really more than they do as individuals. And the truth is God may or may not lead you and, and your spouse to be like Aquila and Priscilla. Chances are you, you don't necessarily work together or, or do the same ministries in the church together or do everything exactly the way that they did. But we do have families. We do have people in our life that God has put in our life. And I think we can't miss the gospel priority that God leads us to be thinking about. How can I share life with my family members? I'm often in, in connection with these people at some of the, the most important moments of life, holidays and birthdays and anniversaries and weddings and graduations and dedications and funerals. How can I leverage those to bring Jesus into the midst of these connections? And again, family is not a time to... Um, make them feel guilty, uh, or to be constantly convictional. But it's an opportunity for us to look for ways to connect our faith and our family. Say, who are the people in my family, and how is God calling me to connect with them? And again, I think we can look at these same three groups of people and say, who, who's new in my family? Is there somebody who's married into the family right now, and, and maybe God is calling me to, to form a connection with that person? 
Even if they weren't the person I would have chosen to be a family member of mine, maybe God is still leading me to kind of lead the charge and say, welcome to the family. We are glad that you are a part. I want to get to know you and to share my life with you. Maybe there's partners within our family and other family members who share our faith. And again, much like work, we're saying to them, how can we together kind of bring Jesus into our family conversations in a way that is loving and approachable and that people don't feel condemned, but they feel invited into the the grace of a relationship with a God who loves them and pursues them and is with them? How can we hold one another accountable to make sure that in our family settings we're still being a good witness for Christ? And maybe we can look for outsiders as well with our family. And outsiders are people that that might not necessarily be in our family, but the reality is maybe they don't don't really have a family that they can connect with. They don't really have that, that same connection. Maybe an elderly single or somebody who is disabled or or somebody who might be homeless, or, or maybe even somebody who's a transplant to the community, and, and they don't have family that lives here, and you get together all the time with your family, but, but they really don't have a family, and they're just looking for somebody that they could connect with. I think about a, a family that, that kind of did that for us when we lived um, in, in Florida, and it was just kind of funny, and there was all of these birthdays and anniversaries and weddings that they had, and, and we would always end up, and it would be the O'Connors, and there's John Christia and Jillian, and it was just kind of this funny surrogate add-on to all of these family things that we were a part of, but, but sometimes God is calling us to be that for somebody else and say, who is outside my family, but they don't really have that connection, and how can I offer that to them? The third place that I think we need to connect with people is within the church. Verse 4 of our passage says that Paul went every Sabbath to the synagogue to meet with people and to share the gospel. And when Timothy and Silas go to Corinth, they join together in trying to advance the gospel. The church is probably the single most important place for followers of Jesus to connect with other people. The church is not a building. The church is a gathering of people whose point of connection is that we are on some level of a journey of understanding and connecting with God. And and we're all at different points in that, and that's okay. Some of us would say, you know, I've, I've had a relationship with Jesus, and it has been rock solid and strong for decades. And some of us may say, you know what, I connect with the church, but in reality, I haven't stepped across the line. I don't even know if I believe in Jesus. I'm just kind of on the journey trying to understand, is this Jesus real? Are these people real? And, but our point of connection at the church is that we are people who are on this journey of understanding Jesus together. The church is people. It is people that, that bear God's image. It is people that are the temple where the Spirit of God resides. We need the church. And we need one another. And we need connection with one another. Unfortunately, I think for many Christians, the church has less and less importance in their life. And I fear that for some, for some they look at the mistakes of previous generations and they, they walk away from the church. They're looking for an accurate representation of Jesus and and there's been something that's happened and they say, when I look at that, I don't really see Jesus. And I gotta be honest, I've been a part of of church and and, and even as a pastor, there have been times where I've heard things said about me and and said about church and and about others and I've kind of gone, it just stings a little bit. I'm not sure that that's a representation of God. Here's the thing I see in Paul that is really interesting to me. Every city he goes to the first place he goes is the synagogue. Every time. And every time when Paul is, is, is chased out of the city, it's the people of the synagogue who are chasing him out of the synagogue and out of the city. And yet when Paul goes to the next city, Paul goes back to the synagogue. And there's something about Paul that he says, I've got to connect with God's people here. Now, not everybody in the synagogue is one of God's people. Any more than everybody in an American church is one of God's people. But Paul constantly is saying, this is where I have the best opportunity to connect with those people. And in a very real way, to connect them with God and to connect me with God. I also fear that a lot of Christians have a misunderstanding of relationship and religion. I think a lot of evangelical Christians 
at least if you've been one for a while, are probably familiar with this phrase that we, we tout a lot in Christianity. We say it's, it's about a relationship with Jesus, not about a religion. And there's some correct theology in that. Paul talks about this over and over again in the New Testament, and we'll unpack some of it when we get to our series about Ephesians. But God offers us grace to connect with him apart from the Old Testament law. And we, we talked about this when, when Paul had the Jerusalem council and he said, a, a Gentile doesn't have to become a Jew in order to connect with Christ. And, and, and your relationship with Jesus is dependent upon his grace offered to you through his death on the cross. It, it's not a strict moralistic code. But too often we apply our gathering with other believers as a religious habit, and it's not. It's an essential part of our relationship with God. Now, now, there are a lot of religious habits that we have when we gather on Sunday. And sometimes people hold on to those religious habits tighter than they should. You know, what the lighting looks like, what color things are, what the carpet is, what the pastor dresses in, what the music we play is, all kinds of things, what kind of prayers we use, what kind of songs we sing. And we hold on to these things, and, and they are a part of our religious habits, and they help us connect with God, but they're not the point. But our gathering together is not just a religious habit. It is part of our connection to God, because again, it is people who are made in God's image. And God tells us in the New Testament, his temple is our hearts. It's our life. If I'm going to connect with God, the place where I connect with him is when I gather together with his people. People bear God's image. Not a building, not a mountain, not a lake, not a campground. If we want to connect with God, we need to be in the one place where God said his image is, people. And we need to be in the one place where the New Testament tells us the Spirit of God resides, in a gathering and a collection of the hearts of his people. And that's not to say that God isn't omnipresent, and that's not to say that he doesn't somehow meet with us in places outside of gatherings of, of, of followers of his he can and he may move in your life in those times. But that is to say that it is essential that we connect in this place. To claim to have a connection with Jesus and habitually and willfully reject meeting him in the one place he calls us to meet with him and he died to establish his church and his bride, the gathering of his people. There's simply no basis for it in scripture. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, God says, I move in my people. And I'm not looking to condemn anyone this morning, but I want to tell us the truth. God says our gathering as his people matter, and we need one another, and we need connections with one another. And when we gather together as a church, again, we ought to be looking for how we can connect more with some of these same groups of people. Who are the people who are new in my congregation they're a new part of it. Maybe they're a transplant to this area or maybe God has called them and led them here for a different reason. And how can I connect and welcome them here? Maybe they're a new person who's just walked across that line of faith and said, I'm trusting in Jesus for the first time. How can I connect my life with them and help them to understand the hope that I have in Jesus? We connect with our partners within the church and people that help us to live out the unique mission that God has for us. And we obviously have to connect with outsiders and realize that we don't exist only for ourselves, but we exist as a place that is trying to say, Jesus wants to connect with more than just us. He died on a cross to save more than just me. How can I offer grace and hope and the gospel to the community that I live in? Which leads me to the fourth place that I see Paul connecting, and that's the community. Paul makes connections with people in, in the community, or maybe we could say the neighborhood. Every time Paul is chased out of the synagogue, he says the same basic thing. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And I believe that God calls us as followers of Christ to be involved in our community and in our neighborhood. And if we've gotten these other points of connection down, and, and for a lot of us we feel like, man, I go to work and I work all day and I've got my family to take care of. And then for some of us I'm, I'm connected in church and I'm plugged in there and it feels like I'm so exhausted and I'm so tired. And the reality is that the Christian journey isn't always like an easy one. And God wants to stretch us. And he says, I got one more for you. I want you to connect 
with your community and, and in the neighborhood. I want you to, to meet your neighbor and start a friendship. I want you to join a nonprofit that benefits the community. I want you to be a part of a parents group in the school. I want you to lend a, a helping hand to someone else. I have a lot of friends uh, who, who live in Florida. Some of them serve as pastors, and some of them are just um, people that were in the church that we were in before we moved here. When Hurricane Irma came through um, last week, one of the things that stood out to me was there were so many of, of our friends that were there, and they were saying, what is really interesting is to watch how the community has come together, and, and people are out in the neighborhood, and they're, they're talking to one another, and as we're, we're putting up plywood on the, the windows, we're, we're sharing drills, and we're sharing plywood, and, and we're talking about the plans that we have, and, and a lot of the pastors especially were saying, why does it take a tragedy for us to connect? Why does it take something like that? I mean, praise God that we are, but, but why does it take that? As the people of God, we ought to be the ones leading the way and forming redemptive connections with others and shining a light of love in the world we live in. As followers of Jesus, we ought to be the first one when somebody moves on our block to go over there and to say, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. My name is John. I just wanted to say hi. I wanted to let you know I live over there. If you ever need anything, let me know. Um, and I'm just so glad that you're here. We ought to be connecting with partners in our community, people who are doing the redemptive work of God. And we can say, we want to be involved in what God is doing in and through excuse me, those organizations. And we need to be open again to those in our midst who feel like the outsider. Those in our community and in our neighborhoods who, who don't have the point of connection and they're kind of on the outside looking in and, and saying, how can I intentionally connect with them? So I said, these are the, these are the where's. These are where I see Paul connecting at work, uh, within families, within the church, and within the community. And I said that he started out kind of the, the how was sharing life with people. But there's one other thing that I think is, is important for us to talk about this morning. We stopped our, our, ver, our passage in verses 9 through 11 because something important happens in Paul's life that enables him to have stronger connections in Corinth than, than maybe he's ever had before this point of time. Paul makes a commitment to the people of Corinth. Town after town after town that Paul has gone to, he's been chased out of town fearing for his life. But here in Corinth, God gives him this vision and he says, I will protect you if you just stay put here for a little while. And so Paul makes a commitment to the people of Corinth and he stays with them for a year and a half. Connections with people and relationships take time. And it's probably pretty safe to say that the longer we spend in a relationship and the, the deeper we're willing to connect, the, the, the greater that connection will be and the deeper it will go. And this is why for a lot of us, some of the most painful moments in an experience is when a husband and a wife who have been connected and have spent time and have poured energy into connecting with one another when, when a marriage ends. Or maybe somebody that we have spent a long time getting to know and somebody that we have deeply cared about and we've connected our whole life and they, they pass away. It is a, a deep break because we have spent time getting to know them. I don't want us to miss how important commitment is in Paul's life and in his relationship here. Corinth was a special place for Paul. He had a special connection there because more than most of the cities that he's been a part of, he, he committed to Corinth and he, he put down some roots, so to speak, there. In fact, a lot of you know that Paul, he writes all these letters and a lot of our New Testament are what we would call these epistles of the Apostle Paul where he writes letters to some of these churches he visits. And he writes two letters to this church, the church in Corinth. They're the longest and tied for the second longest letters he writes and they comprise 33% of everything Paul would ever write. We have to be open to sharing our lives with people in order to connect with them in a way that allows God to move. But just as important as being open in the first place is being committed to the connections that we form. Our culture, I think, struggles with this. In America, we struggle with commitment, and sometimes we make changes just way too easy. And I think sometimes God might have us to stop and to look at the places where we connect. And instead of changing a job really quickly just for a better opportunity or advancement or more money, sometimes God would have us to say, should I commit here because of what God is doing in the connections that I have? Let's be honest, as Americans, we sometimes change our family too often. 
And I think that one's pretty unequivocal. Divorce does not honor God in any way, shape, or form. And sometimes we just need to dig our heels in and to trust that God is going to bring the protection and the healing and to seek out counseling and help in our marriages. Sometimes as people, we change our churches too quickly. Ah, oh, they changed the color of the, the carpet, and I can't go there anymore. Hey, they moved a piece of furniture. I, the pastor didn't wear a tie this week. Come on. Can, can we commit to people who are on the journey of sharing Jesus with our community together? Sometimes we change the community we live in too quickly. And we're willing to, to move out. and We, we want a, a bigger house, a better yard, uh, better safety and security and, and things that God never really says in Scripture are His goal for our life. And sometimes God wants us to commit. Now, I'm not saying that God never moves a person and never calls them to make a transition. I'm not saying God never calls us to make a, a job transition. Obviously, Paul is in Corinth for a year and a half. And for Paul, that's, that's deep commitment because he's a guy that God is using to go from place to place to place. But what I am saying is that there's something of a depth of connection that happens when we are willing to commit. And that's one of the things I see that Paul does here in Corinth that, that is different than his other relationships and his other connections. As he trusts God when God says, I will protect you and I want you to stay a while and, and form those relationships. Paul made connections with people by simply sharing life with them. He intersected with people at work, within families, at church, and in the community. And the connections he made were strengthened and productive, at least in part, because he was willing to be committed to stay with them for a little while. Let me pray for you this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your connection with me, first of all. I want to thank you that God looked at, at me and, and, and saw a broken sinner and, and that Jesus would die on a cross, that I could be forgiven and I could be changed and I could know you. And God, I want to thank you for people that you put in my life who are made in your image. And there's a lot of squirrely people and a lot of people that I, that I don't like and I don't get along with. There's a lot of people that I dearly love and I naturally connect with. But they are all made in your image. And God, for me, I pray that you would help me to share my life with those people. I pray, God, that you would help me to see the people in all the places where I go that you have put into uh, my life and into my path. Help me not to turn a blind eye. Help me not to condemn them, but help me to just share life, just to be willing to open up myself because, Jesus, you are the most integral part of my life. And so as I share life with them, somehow I move closer to you and, and they get to move closer to you. God, help me to be a person of commitment who is willing to stay true to the people who are in my life and to, to know when it is time to go and to know when it is time that you say, commit and stay for a while. I'm with you and I'm in this thing. Help us to know your voice and your leading in those times and not just to chase after our own desires, but to, to follow you and to be obedient. And God, I thank you for the connections that take place in this church. And God, I pray for our congregation. I pray that some of our people would connect in small groups. And God, that you would be with them in, in ways that help them connect outside of just this time. I pray that you would help them to continue to value the times where we gather together even before and after this service starts. And they just get to, to talk and encourage one another, to pray with one another, and to, to be a part of what you're doing. God, I thank you for the partnerships that you have brought to our church that we are going to be excited to share more about next week. That give us an opportunity to connect with people. God, I pray that you would bless us as your people. Use us as your people. Allow us to be Jesus to others, to make a connection with them, as you have called us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope that our service has been a blessing to you and your point of connection back with uh, Jesus Christ. And I pray that you have a, an awesome week. Uh, we want to remind you, as always, we would love to have you stay for a while to talk to one another, encourage one another, pray with one another. I've said this before, but it's been a while since I've said it, so I'll say it again. What happens before the service and after the service is possibly more important than what happens during the service. So spend some time. Connect with one another. God bless.